here, church family? Chris, before you leave, can we uh, just clarify something? I don't know if I was the only one, but the, the, so we had 600 shoes come in from the school, shoe requests. I, I, I think there was excitement because maybe we thought we had met the 600 needs. I just want to clarify that that's the needs coming in. The work still needs to be done, correct? Yes. Am I right on that? Okay, all right, cool. Ah, yeah, another school. Got it. All right, cool. Just want to clarify that. Um, I've been out this week, so I don't know nothing. Um, other than what we're doing today, today we're going to finish up a series in Nehemiah. And if you've missed any part of this series, uh, you can go and give it a look or a listen on the mobile app or the website. It's all there for you. And uh, really, this series has focused on these like big moments in Nehemiah's life, in, 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 in the time specifically he led Israel in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And so we're we're looking at uh, the, the moment God broke Nehemiah's heart for his hometown. If you were here, you remember it. Uh, not just that, but we've, saw, we've, we've seen a, a theme, really, in Nehemiah's prayer life that is very similar to what we've seen from our Lord and Savior. In fact, in Luke 5, we're told that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and would pray. And Nehemiah, man, he was in constant communication with God. Nehemiah, he truly just had no desire to do anything unless God was in it, unless God was a part of it. He wanted nothing to do with the plan unless it was for God and with God. We've also seen in Nehemiah incredible courage and boldness, haven't we? I mean, Nehemiah, man, he was willing to take some risks to accomplish what God put on his heart. Not just that, but Nehemiah didn't see obstacles. They teach you this in business school. It's not an obstacle. It's a Opportunity, right? And Nehemiah was all over this. He, he, he knew that, that God was bigger than all of it. Or he, he was over it all, and he just trusted God and leaned in. And we look at that, man, and we said, hey, if we can take a page from Nehemiah's playbook here and just rely on God, then he can use us to change the world. We've also discussed in this series how valuable the church is. The, the idea here is that the image of God uh, it, it just cannot be seen in any one person. I'm sorry. It just can't, like, not even close. See, to show the world who God is, we must work together. A, a good analogy I like to use here is uh, to think of the church as a puzzle, right? And, and the church is, is, is like a puzzle, and God is the, the final completed image that we're seeking to display to the world. But in order for it to be seen, all the pieces need to be connected, we need to be working together. We need to be in relationship with one another, walking as one. So really, everyone has a role to play. And, and Nehemiah shows us that it took everyone dedicating themselves to the completion of the wall for it to get done. And God displayed through Nehemiah really a picture of the church before it was even a thing. It was really cool. In week four, we discussed opposition. We said that just because Nehemiah got permission from the king to go do the work didn't mean that everyone was going to like what he was doing, right? As followers of Christ, we will face opposition from the spiritual forces of evil that seek to derail us and destroy us. Nehemiah sets an example for us as we follow opposition. Prayer, prayer, and more prayer. We must pray. We must stand firm. We must fight for what is right and what is good and what is holy, and we must protect those that are most vulnerable in our communities. Last week, we saw that God's people must build a foundation on God's word, that we must hear the word of God and we must ask ourselves immediately, what must I do because of what I've heard? See, God's people aren't just people that know the truth. No, God's people are people being changed by the truth. You're probably familiar with how James, the brother of Jesus, addresses this issue. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so as we lean in to wrap up this series, I'd like to make you aware up front, just want to be fair, okay? The book of Nehemiah doesn't have a Hollywood ending. Far from it, okay? Star Wars fans, like, brace yourself. It's not, it's not like the end of Return of the Jedi where Luke Skywalker rushes off to an Ewok party on the moon of Endor where everybody hugs and dances and plays bongos in a tree fort. That's not how this is going to end. Now, there is a celebration, 
in chapter 12, and you're welcome to go read it on your own. There's a celebration with music and parades and excitement when the people finish the wall and dedicate the walls of the city to the Lord, but that's not how it ends. I wish it was, but that's not how it ends. The book of Nehemiah actually ends in a pretty horrible way. So you're probably like, yay, <laughs> right? And while it is a horrible ending, it's a great opportunity for us to really just celebrate, really just marinate on how great the grace of God really is and, and his love and his mercy and how magnificent these things are and the love he has towards his people. See, there's a theme in chapter 13, and it's this. If we aren't careful, we can drift away from God. Right? That's, that's what we see. We, 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 we never reach this point in our lives where we're immune to drifting or, or falling away from what we know is good and right and pleasing and holy before God. In fact, it's when we see our depravity that we often have our best view of God's grace. And that's my hope for you today, that you would see God's grace. So let's dive in. Chapter 13, verse 1. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found, written, that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Now here's what's going on. The leadership of the church is messing up real bad. Now, you, and, and, and here's, you might read that and you might think, oh, this is a racial issue here. It's not. This is not a racial issue. This is a religious issue. That's what's going on. People from other religions are being put in positions of influence over the church. These are people that God has given an opportunity for them to repent and worship him. And they've said, no, 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 we don't want you, God. We want our own set of laws. We want to be our own God. We want our own religion. We want to do things our way. Sound familiar? These people that want nothing to do with Yahweh are helping to lead God's people spiritually. It's nuts. It's crazy. It's reckless. It'd be like... It'd be like you showing up here today to find out that I'd hired a Hindu or a Muslim to preach. Would you be excited about that? We just, we just want to be inclusive around here, though. Like, we're open and tolerant of all. What? Like, Mormon Dave, come on up. You're going to give the sermon today. Look how diverse we are. You think things are going to go well around here next week if that happens? No. Look at verse 4. Before this... Eliashib the priest. Now, okay, so Eliashib would be like an elder, an overseer. He's responsible for the church. He's supposed to take care of the church. He's like a lead pastor, right? He's supposed to keep an eye on things and make sure things are moving smoothly. So Eliashib had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. Now, in case you missed week four of this series, Tobiah ticks me off. I don't like this guy. Tobiah, you shouldn't either. Tobiah is a bad guy. He tried to murder Nehemiah. He hates Nehemiah. He hates God. He hates God's people. He hates God's church. Tobiah sucks. But Eliashib decides, well, he's not that bad. He's all right. It seems like a nice enough guy. I'll, I'll let him marry my daughter. So Eliashib lets this sad excuse for a man marry his daughter, and now he's in the family, okay? Like, and you thought your family get-togethers were nightmares. I'm telling you, try having Tobiah over for Thanksgiving, right? I don't know about you, but I'd be chopping at Tobiah's neck, and I'd spare the turkey. I'd pull up a, I'd pull up a chair for Turkey Tom, right, and send Tobiah in the fryer. Like, let's go. It's not just that. There's more for us to see here. I'm, I'm going to spend, I'm going to say more about this in a little bit. So, so this is going to be a short little nugget here. But Eliashib reminds us here, as we read this, we should be reminded that pastors are human too. Don't put your pastor on a pedestal. He'll fall. Verse 5. 
And he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. Okay, so this would be like me clearing out the church office space so that my new son-in-law could have a place to stay. This is not good. Like, Tobiah hates God, yet he's being allowed to live in God's house? What is going on? See, the offerings and the tithes, they were part of their worship. And so really, their worship is being cleared out to make room for someone that's never offered a gift to anyone but himself. Really? Now, before we get all judgmental here on Eliashib, Eliashib isn't the only one prone to drift. You are too. I am too truth is all believers have a tendency to become less serious about holiness and more tolerant of our sin we all have a tendency we let our guard down we start letting things into our lives that that don't bring us closer to god but they actually create separation between us and god we let that stuff in now listen to me the drift is usually a result of believers not being in the word enough and if it's not that then it's christians that are more engaged in community with unbelievers than they are with believers Those are the two really markers of when that starts to happen. And and I don't know, man, I'm reading through this. I'm like, the question just burning in me all week, uh, like for Eliashib is like, where where are his brothers in Christ? You think, like, where are his brothers in Christ that are willing to call him out? How did it get this far before somebody loved him enough to say, look, man, Eliashib, I love you. I'm not sure what you're after here, but this isn't what God wants for you. Why are you pursuing this? Where's the guy saying, Eliashib, I love you, man. Let's just crack open Deuteronomy, and let's just remind ourselves what God desires for us. Let's get in the Word together, and let's, let's find that out. Let's, let's pursue that together. Like, listen to me. If you're serious about following Jesus, but you aren't in His Word, and you aren't surrounded by people who are willing to call you out, who, who love Him and are willing to call you out on your stuff, listen to me, then you're playing with fire. You are playing with fire, and you're going to get burned. Psalm 119 says that I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And when I read that, I think about our Lord and Savior who taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We must be vigilant in prayer and persistent in our pursuit of holiness if if we're going to keep from veering off track. And the truth is, some of you need to course correct here. You need to to fix this. You need to straighten things out. But as you do, please never forget that God offers grace to those who seek him. Right? Like, you just, if you get nothing else today, get that. God offers grace to those who seek him, period. Let's be real. Some of us need to kick Tobiah out of the storehouse, amen? Are you with me? Like some of you have made room for your treasure where you're supposed to make room for God. But listen to me. Because of Christ in you, you have the power to kick that thing out. Send it back and kick Tobiah out. I plead with you, kick him out and make room for God. Look at verse 6. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah's like, hey man, don't look at me. Okay, I wasn't there. They did this when I wasn't even looking. Look, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. And so Nehemiah's been in Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem for 12 years. He knew Eliashib. I mean, Elishab and him, were, they were like family. Elishab is one of the very first names. He is the very first name that we see in chapter 3 on the list of builders. He's the first one to show us that the priests went first. He, he rebuilt the sheep gate. He was one of the first to pick up tools and mortar and get to work on the wall. And when it was done, check this, he dedicated it to the Lord. I need to double down on this before we move on. Stop putting your faith in people. You will get burned. 
You need to put your faith in God. And pastors are people too. We're people too. We're going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. But listen to me, God will not let you down. God will never let you down. Next week, we're launching a series called Church Hurt. I'm pretty excited about it in like a terrified, excited way. Um, <laughs> because so much of our hurt comes from the fact that we rely on people instead of God. Like the truth is, saved people still hurt people. Like I, I, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it wasn't. I, I, but it is. That's how these things work. In fact, what I want you to do, I want you to mark your calendar right now, okay? If you got to take out your phone, whatever, jot it down. Mark your calendar for November 13th, okay? This is going to, we're going to do things a little different that Sunday. It's going to be awesome, and I, I'd really just like for you to be here, okay? So mark it down. Um, try and make plans to be here, and, and we'll give you more details as that series unfolds. I believe we have, do we have the, did we have the QR for that? We didn't have that? That's Okay. So, so we're going to have that in the next couple weeks, guys, where we're going to actually ask you to tell us about your unresolved church hurt and the things that, that maybe you need to reconcile with another believer or maybe that you're not able to, but you need to reconcile through God with that believer. Um, either way, we want to walk with you in that space. So we're going to give you opportunities. Keep your eye on the newsletter, okay, push notes and things like that, and we're going to be sending that out. We really want your stories, okay? We're not just, this isn't just talk. We want to hear your stories, and we want to help you through them. Uh, and so keep an eye out for that. But look how, um, look how Nehemiah responds to uh, the evil taking place in the temple. Look at this. He, said, he says, and I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture at Tobiah out of the chamber. Now, the Hebrew word for angry there means angry. And uh, <laughs> but, look, before you condemn Nehemiah, know that there is good anger and bad anger. Okay, this is good anger. This is good anger. You'll, you, and you'll find a similar anger, actually, in chapter 5, if you want to go back and look at it, when the rich were exploiting, exploiting the poor. You'll see a similar anger. And Nehemiah makes it clear that when, men and women who love God will learn to love what God loves and learn to hate what God hates. They don't, we, they don't enjoy their sin. They hate it. And the same is true for the sins that we see in others. We don't hate them, but we hate the sin, Right? When, when, when something God designed for a specific purpose is being used improperly, anger is righteous. Years later, we see a similar behavior from Jesus. Do you remember in, in Matthew 21? It says Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Hmm. Simply put, Worship matters to God. Very much so. And Nehemiah knows this. Look at verse 9. He said, I gave orders to purify the rooms. <laughs> I love this. He's grabbing Lysol wipes, trying to get Tobias' stench out of the room, right? Just cleaning that thing up. And then I, I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. But keep, keep reading with me. Verse 10. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. Look, people stopped giving because they didn't trust the people overseeing their gift. It's not good. And because the giving stopped, the church staff had to go get jobs in the fields. Everything's falling apart. Look, Transparency and trust must be paramount if the church is going to be healthy financially. Transparency and trust. That's how we operate around here. And Nehemiah knows this, which is why he does what seems to be a lost art these days. Look at verse 11. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? So here's a little nugget for church life, if you're new to this. Sometimes loving someone requires that you rebuke them. Now, you don't have to be a jerk about it, right? You don't have to be rude. There is a way to lovingly rebuke a believer in Christ, a follower of Christ. But avoiding telling them something that you know that they need to hear, that's not love. That's not love. Look, then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. 
All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shalima, Sh- Shalemia. I struggled with that one. Nailed it last week when I practiced. Shalemia, the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakor, the son of Madaniah, their assistant because they were considered trustworthy. Trustworthy. And they were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. So there are three parts, okay, three to the final chapter in Nehemiah. Three really big issues being addressed, all right? The importance of our worship to God and our service to one another and the church, right? That's really the first issue. We need to trust one another. This needs trust, and we need to take our sin seriously, and we need to realize that people are sinners, and what do sinners do? Sinful stuff. In fact, we're going to see this sinful stuff continue in these other two big issues in chapter 13. Nehemiah's next going to address the Sabbath, and then marriage and family, and we're going to cover both. And the warning is clear throughout. I don't want you to lose the big picture here. Not taking our sin seriously leads to all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. And if we aren't careful, we'll start slipping. So let's pick it up, back up in uh, verse 15. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day people from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Isn't this why the walls were down? But now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. Now, anytime we talk about the Sabbath, the Sabbath, it, it just quickly becomes an identity issue. Because what's going on during the days of Nehemiah is that work has become everything. It's the whole deal. Work was leaving no room for family. It was leaving no room for church or friends or fun or rest or hobbies or sport or joy or anything. It was just work. And it's a slippery slope when we focus too heavily on earning and not enough on resting. You see, the Sabbath was put in place really to go against our nature. And it's so good. We want to earn what can't be earned. That's in us. We love the feeling that we get when we've accomplished something for ourselves. We, we love it, right? We take pride in that. We're like, ooh, look what I did. We're taught even young, mom, look what I did. But if we aren't careful, that feeling can become more valuable to us than the feeling that comes when something has been accomplished for us. See, by nature, we prefer the first feeling. That's the one we want. We like to think that we can do things for ourselves. See, it's not natural for us to just pause, stop, rest, and consider the one that did for us what we could never do on our own. Never. But we don't like that. What do you mean I could never do it? I think I could do it. No, you can't. So Nehemiah addresses it in verse 19. He says, When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. (laughs) I love Nehemiah. You do that again, I'm going to slap you silly. All right? In fact, this is where we decided we would be a good time to announce our new ministry strategy. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. But seriously, here's a question for you to marinate on this week. Who in this church knows you and loves you enough to lay hands on you when you're wrong? Who is it? 
See, because if you can't name someone in this church that doesn't live with you, that would lay hands on you when you're wrong, when you're out of line, I pray, I plead with you to reevaluate how you're doing Christian community. He goes on. He says, from that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> it's like, right? <laughs> then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. So God says, once a week, just stop earning, stop grinding, and just rest and be my child. Your identity isn't in these things. That's not, that's not what makes you who you are. Your identity is in me. It's in Christ. Your identity isn't in what you can accomplish this week or what you can get done or how good you are at this or how well you do at cleaning yourself up or whether you do this or whether you do that or whether you don't. Your identity is found in your adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. That is who you are. You are a child of God, not because of anything you did, but because of what Christ did for you. Rest in that. Rest. Stop what you're doing and just remember that and just reflect on the love that Christ has shown you that he would step out of the presence of God so that you would be able to step into the presence of God. Marinate on that. Never let that go. That's never old news. That's just good news. As we attempt to clean ourselves up and look, you might say, hey, I'm not guilty of that. We all are. As we attempt to clean ourselves up and present ourselves for God's approval, I picture the Sabbath as God just kind of screaming down from heaven like, stop! Stop scrubbing for a moment and just look at me. Yeah, but God, I still need to do this side. No, stop. But God, I'm getting pretty good at this. Look, look, see how clean, look, good at what? Good at what? You're already mine. You were bought at a price. Stop working for what I've already given to you. You need to know that God doesn't love some better version of you. He's not in love with you 2.0. He's not waiting for you to download new software or install the new OS. Christ died while we were still sinners. He knew everything about you that you don't like or that is sinful or that missed the mark. He knew it all, and he still did it. He still did it. Folks, he became sin. The one who had no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's why it's called amazing grace. Because it's amazing. It's so good. Man, but we say, Josh, yeah, but I need to stop cussing. Okay, look, yeah, probably. Like, that's probably a good idea. Maybe you should stop doing that. But listen to me, you, you washing the nasty out of your mouth doesn't save you. Like if you do manage to wash it all out, praise God if you do, there's going to be something else to wash. There's going to be something else to scrub clean. There's always something else. But Josh, I have a real problem with lust and porn. Okay. And let me say this, which isn't just, we, we hear that in the church and we're like, man, you got a real problem. I'm sorry, no, this is a problem for women too. It's becoming a real epidemic it already is. I have a real problem with lust and porn. Okay, look, listen to me. Porn will destroy you. I know. That's not a one-liner for me. It almost destroyed me. It almost destroyed my marriage. Okay? It will destroy your marriage, listen to me, even if you aren't married yet. You're setting a foundation for it already. If you're pre-marriage or in between or whatever's going on, it will destroy your marriage. Porn will, absolute, porn will absolutely wreck your life and you should seek to overcome it. But listen to me, you no longer viewing that crap doesn't save you. Yeah, but Josh, I need to quit drinking and smoking. And the nicotine has had me for decades and I need to sort that thing out. Yeah, you probably do. Your lungs will probably thank you. Your gums will probably thank you. Yes, you should probably do that. But not, not messing with that stuff anymore is not what saves you. You can't scrub yourself clean, guys. You just can't. There's only one thing that saves you. You want to know what it is? Look at this. 1 John 1, 7. Memorize this. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 
that's it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross. That's it. That's what washes us clean. Don't ever let go of that. So Nehemiah gets mad about one more thing, and then that's just, I'm sorry, but that's just kind of how this ends. <laughs> In verse 23, Nehemiah gets angry because people know what God says about marriage and family, but instead of like following God's instruction and being obedient to that, they actually decide to change things up. Like, we got this. And so really, since our world has lost its mind, let's just do a quick rundown of biblical marriage and sexuality. Our culture likes to pretend that marriage is something that man created and because they believe that man created it they think it's actually within their right to change it but they're wrong they're wrong man didn't create marriage God did you can't change it it's not yours to change and so I remember how all this went down you probably do and I know Pastor Steve touched on it last week but our our culture really started by saying that you can marry whoever you want I remember when that went down, I was like, I thought that was crazy, right? I was like, what, married? Marry whoever you want? No, you can do, you can be together, but it ain't called marriage. But then it recently shifted to not only can Doug now marry Dave, but if Doug wants to be like, be Darlene and then marry Dave, then he or she or like whatever can do that too. And unfortunately, it's a lie from Satan because God created man and woman and he established marriage and sexuality for them so they could could enjoy one another and enjoy God together. And so really to fully understand this, we need to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. God looks at his creation and he says, it's good. He says it's good. But God makes man, and he says, what? No good. No good. It's not good for man to be alone. He needs a helpmate. Now, okay, <laughs> before all the ladies get upset, okay, this isn't, this isn't like, that doesn't mean women are lesser than men. Both are image bearers and are made in the likeness of God. So they're different. Boy, <laughs> are they different. But they also have different roles, and they perfectly complement each other. It's beautiful. And so while men and women are different, they have equal dignity, value, and worth before God. And so look, when men and women pursue biblical marriage, it is the most beautiful picture of God we have in all of creation. It is full, it is beautiful, it is wonderful. Biblical marriage. So again, man alone, no good, right? God makes woman and God establishes himself over it as father, brings the woman to the man, similar to how a, a, a dad walks his baby girl down the aisle on her wedding day, right? That picture is happening. And so God officiates the first wedding and introduces Adam and Eve to one another. And once again, everything is good, is good. And it gets even better because after the wedding, God tells him to get busy making babies. Right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. We can be excited about that, folks. But then look at this. Then towards the end of Genesis 2, God lays out the blueprint for marriage. Very simple. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So you're no longer two individuals. You are one. And so if I could just summarize the biblical stance on marriage and sexuality, this is it. God created sex to be enjoyed in a marriage covenant between a husband and a wife. And so listen to me very carefully. Anything outside that design is not biblical sexuality. Whether it's same sex, whether it's a screen, or whether it's the absence of a ring. It's outside design. One flesh and one God. Listen to me. One flesh and one God is key for the family to thrive. That's what we need. And Nehemiah, listen, Nehemiah is angry because the men agreed to God's standards, but later they defy God and their wives and their children, they're they're, they're paying the price for their disobedience. And these men, they knew better. They knew better, and we know they knew better because look at chapter 10, verse 30, they say this. This will just blow your mind. They said, we promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. We promise. 
And so Nehemiah is furious with this group of men because they're disrespecting God. They're disrespecting God's design and commands regarding marriage, sexuality, and family and how it's to operate. Look what happens next. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women of, uh, excuse me, married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Now, again, I'm going to underscore this. It's important to note that these aren't different racial groups. These are different religions, okay? It, that's how they categorize. So this text in the past, it's been used to preach against interracial marriage, and it's just not there. It's bogus. So this, what this is, is this would be like men in this body marrying Mormon women or Hindu women or Muslim women. That would be bad. That is, that is a crisis for those individuals and for this church as a whole. It's an absolute crisis. But look, half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod uh, or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. Here's why this is so horrible. The Bible's in Hebrew. The Bible's in Hebrew. So to know your Bible, you need to know what? Hebrew. To know God's designs, to know the way he loves you and has affection for you, you have to know Hebrew. Yet here, we have a bunch of kids who are members of the church, and their dad's wives are from another church background, and the dad has failed to teach them the language so that they could understand biblical truth, understand the Bible, understand who God is. Right? They, 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 they know mom's language, but they don't know dad's. That hit me hard. And it's pretty simple. When you see a generation floundering, don't point to that generation as the problem. Point to the fathers of that generation as the problem. Fathers are the head of the family. And, and nations rise and fall by the strength of the family. You need strong fathers to have strong families in order to build strong communities, strong churches, strong nations. Now, I'm not saying that we should employ Nehemiah's response here, but I'd be lying if I told you I didn't think about it sometimes. <laughs> Check this out. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I, <laughs> I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. And so I just want to be really frank with you guys. Look, anytime you think I'm being too hard on you up here, I just want you to recall Nehemiah's approach, okay? <laughs> right? I'm just a softy. I can't help. I'm just a softy. He's cursing down on them. He's beating some of them and pulling out their hair. And, and look, and as much as the urge may present itself, we can't just go around beating one another and pulling out our hair. Let me share this little nugget with you, and maybe you'll understand why Nehemiah reacted that way, because I think a lot of you might be thinking right now, whoa, I think Nehemiah's out of line. So let me give you this little nugget, and you tell me if you still think that Nehemiah's out of line. Amman was the area in Transjordan around the city of Amman. Tobiah, yep, I thought we were done with this guy too. Evidently not. <laughs> He's back. Tobiah is influential in this area, but check this. The Ammonites worshipped the god of Melech by sacrificing children in fire. They burned the children alive. The Moabites worshipped Chemosh. They also sacrificed their children, sometimes in fire, sometimes in other methods. I, I, I'll spare you. Look at Leviticus 18. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Melech, for you must not profane the name of your god. I am the Lord. These men knew what God wanted for them and their families. They just stopped caring. It really is that simple. They stopped caring. And the children and the native women were suffering because of their failure as fathers. Look at Nehemiah, he continues, he says, Was it not because of marriages just like this that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing this, all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? See, Nehemiah is calling these men out for their reckless behavior. Guys, are you in the word? Have you been reading it all? When you sin against God, things don't go good for you. 
and the consequences of our sin, it doesn't just stop with you. How selfish is that thought to think that you can handle all the consequences or they'll only fall on you? No, they reach into the lives of your children and into the lives of your grandchildren. Consequences of sin is real. It shouldn't be hard for us to know why God hates sin so much because it wrecks us. It tears things up. It, it, it makes messes of our lives. It destroys us, and it destroys those that we love. And Nehemiah, he goes on to name names. One of the sons of Joada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. And I drove him away from me. <laughs> I love that. It's like Nehemiah. I just visualize Nehemiah going after Joada for a beatdown, maybe pull out some hair, but Joada was just a little too quick, you know? Nehemiah might be losing a step here. But, but seriously, Nehemiah comes back to the root of the issue. Why did all this start? Because there was a spiritual leader that didn't do a good job leading his family. That's why it all started. He allowed a godless man to marry into his family. No one said anything. No one pointed it out. No one had the nerve to say, hey man, you're not walking with the Lord on this. This is not good. Nehemiah needed to return from Babylon to point it out. And because no one, listen to me, because no one did anything, the disrespect for God and the disregard for God's word and his commands was tolerated, but not just that, it escalated. See, the other men in the church, they started looking around, and they started saying, well, man, you know, if my pastor gets to be a godless man, and, and, and if his children get to be, do godless things, then, then I guess it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. Listen to me. You may want to, I don't know, if you write things down, write this down. If you follow the example of man, then you risk following a man that should never be an example. I'm going to say that again. If you follow the example of man, then you risk following a man that should never be an example. Just follow Christ. Just seek Christ. Seek him. Seek to think like Christ. Seek to act like Christ. Seek to look like Christ in everything. Please just look to Christ. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. I don't know if you caught it, but every time Nehemiah covers a difficult topic, every time he corrects something that is wrong with these people, every time he steps in to make it right, he goes to God in prayer and asks God to what? Did you see it? Remember him. Like, look, God, your house is being neglected. This is not good. We've taken steps, though, to right that wrong. Remember me for this. God, your people are so focused on working that they're not, they're, they're not going to church. They're ignoring the needs of their family and their wives and their marriage. That's all they're doing. And, 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 and this has come into the home, and they've lost sight of you, God. But they're going to remember the Sabbath now. We're going to correct this thing. Remember me for this, Lord. Father, men that say they love you but don't act like it, they're destroying their families and this nation by marrying foreign women and bringing a second religion into the home. But Lord, I've put trustworthy, God-fearing spiritual leaders in place, and we're going to bring the household back to one faith and one flesh. One faith and one flesh. Remember me with favor, my God. I don't know how to close this out other than saying, men, we need to get our act together. We need to get our act together. We need to stop showing up, pretending to be men of God, but lacking any effort or desire to die to self, follow his commands, seek his will for our lives. <laughs> like, we need, to, we need to right this ship. Like, man, men, turn off the TV. Turn off the TV while the kids or the grandkids are awake and start teaching them about the creator and savior of their soul. As you worry a little less about what's going on in this nation, worry a little bit more about what's going on in the lives of the people God has put in your life to disciple. Men, I know this one's going to hurt, but I got to say it. Maybe you should spend less time debating doctrine among yourselves 
and make yourself available to one another in an intimate way so that you might wage war on your sin together. Truth is, men, if we seek to identify the root of all our problems in this country, in our homes, in the church, you don't need to look that far, do you? We need to be better. We must be better. So to everyone, I would ask you this. Can you pray like Nehemiah prays in chapter 13? Can you? Remember me for this, my God. Can you say that about anything you've done in your life? I had to ask myself that this week. Can you say, remember me, Lord. Remember me for this. And the truth is, maybe some of us can't say, God, remember me for this. And if that's the case, maybe we need to start by saying, God, forgive me for this. Forgive me. Folks, we know that we have a tendency to slip away from the one that saved us. Please, position yourself beneath the grace and mercy of a God who loves you. After all, it's only when you're resting in that grace and mercy that your work even matters at all. Rest. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to give you some time to just remember Christ and just seek forgiveness for your sins as we, as we take communion together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as I see and look at my own life and I see my depravity, it is, it is vast, Lord. The ways that I have sinned against you and the ways that I have sought for my own desires instead of yours. Lord, as I consider those things, I, I, don't, I don't look at those things except for a desire to see your grace in those things. That you would forgive me that you would give me another chance and Lord that's what can I say but thank you I, don't, I didn't deserve it but you did it anyways and you did it while I was at my worst and so thank you Lord for saving me I know I am not the only person in this room that has a lot of thank yous to deliver and so Lord we remember you we thank you we seek forgiveness for our sins.